Adam, without a doubt, is, or should I say was, my favorite character in the series. His design, his personality, his story, so much was there that all the show needed to do was explore it, expand upon his characters and the ideas that surrounded him. But you just couldn't do that, Rooster Teeth. And that's the whole point of this video. The expectations, the build-up, Adam being nothing more than wasted potential. But before I go any further, it's always important to start from the beginning. So let's rewind the clock all the way back to March 22nd, 2013 and talk first impressions. Adam was introduced all the way back in the Black trailer, so he was technically the fourth character introduced into the series after Ruby, Weiss, and Blake. In this trailer, he and Blake are sneaking aboard a cargo train transporting a ton of Schnee Company dust. Their plan is to plant bombs and destroy it all. On this train, they are met with Atlas Knights where we get some pretty cool action. Spider droids then make an appearance proving to be quite a formidable piece of tech. He and Blake are not capable of destroying it naturally as their moves just don't work against it. So what does Adam do? He charges up, absorbs a full energy blast, and completely destroys the tank. First impressions? pretty damn high. He disintegrated a tank with a single blow. Expectations regarding his combat are up there, but these are just robots. No matter how intelligent they may be, they don't compare to actual people. His fighting was good, but Blake's fighting was also really good. It's more so the destructive force he was capable of dishing out that was impressive. So what other first impressions are given off here? Well, right out of the gate, he's shown to be a leader. It's a two-man operation that he's clearly in charge of. When planting the charges, he has no regard for the people on board, so it shows that he doesn't value human life, but values what he is doing, which we would later find out is the White Fang. So he was stealthy, a leader, and his destructive capabilities were godlike. Blake from the get-go this entire trailer clearly doesn't want to be here, which is why at the end she abandons him. So by the end of it all, I'm left with the feeling of, alright, this looks like a boss character we're getting introduced to early on. So it was a really cool character introduction. Adam wouldn't make another on-screen appearance until the end of Volume 2 as a cameo. So what did we learn from the time in between? More lore is given about the White Fang itself, how a once peaceful organization began to become more extreme. While questionable to some fondness, the fact that it was getting results was good enough considering history has never changed. So we learn of these faunists that are part of this organization that are fighting for equality or at this point to be feared because that's better than being discriminated. As said, Adam isn't here, but Blake does still talk about him. I had a partner named Adam, more of a mentor actually. He always assured me that what we were doing would make the world a better place. But of course, his idea of a perfect future turned out to be not perfect for everyone. She describes him as someone who spiraled into a monster. She talks about how he believed in what he was doing, that this was the only way. Blake consistently talks about having different outlooks from him, which was ultimately the reason she ran. Adam walked that line of a grey character, that good and evil are arbitrary concepts. Yes, humans are being put down, but it's for the betterment of the Faunus. He's doing it in the same way that's been the reverse for Remnant's history. Faunus have always been put down so humans can thrive, so is he really evil in doing what he's doing? when so many have done the exact same thing in reverse and continue to benefit off their suffering. The two had completely different outlooks about how Faunus discrimination should be approached. It was the philosophies and ideologies that clashed between these two. It gave an interesting dynamic, how fighting for a good cause was both wrong, but also right. Blake herself even believed in the way they went about things for a while and hundreds feel the same way. It was a well thought out concept to introduce a villain who isn't really a villain. How do you stop someone from leading a cause that helps Faunus lives? It was a concept that would do nothing more but remain as a concept. Adam's next appearance takes place in a flashback in Volume 3 prior to the trailer's events. This is the lead up and recruitment to the fall of Beacon. Cinder approaches Adam attempting to convince him that assisting with Beacon's demise will help the Faunus be feared as well as help Cinder's people. And this is where Adam's ideologies come into play. He refuses to assist Cinder in her plan because it is a human cause. He doesn't want to risk Faunus' lives for the cause of humans. It is something that he as a leader is fundamentally against. What you need is to leave. You are asking my men to die for your cause. A human cause. That is not an idea I am willing to entertain. It's not until Cinder returns later with some fall maiden powers in which his arm is forced into helping. 
either help or everyone gets killed. Once again, it's characterizing Adam as a leader who values the Faunus much more than he does humans. He's willing to do a job for Cinder if it means she won't slaughter his numbers. Given the scenario, it was his best bet. Next time we see Adam is the fall of Beacon. He unleashes Grimm, his troops, and he goes wild. And this is where the tracks become shaky. Blake up until this moment never described her and Adam's relationship as romantic. More of a mentor, actually. Adam continuously calls Blake my love here, which isn't the problem. The way his character has been established continues to expand here a bit, talking about a revolution and delivering justice to mankind, playing off already well-established goals that drive him. Yang then enters the picture, and this is the moment where everything stems from. Before I go any further, a little pretext. Shane Newville, a former animator for the series and Monty's close friend, released a 36-page letter recounting his time working on the show after Monty died. It's quite the controversial letter. One of the things he mentions in here is the encounter between Adam, Yang, and Blake. According to him, the encounter was originally meant to be an all-out brawl between the three of them, something he was personally excited for but was ultimately cut for an alternative scene. The thing about Adam is that at this point in the show, he had made almost no appearances that they could have taken him in whichever direction they wanted. He had a cool attack against the spider droid, but that was just a robot. According to Shane, some of the animation was already rendered of the fight between the three. He knew it wasn't going to be used for this moment where it was intended, but was told they'll find a place to use it down the road. We all know the direction this scene ended up taking it. Instead of being a fight between the three, they instead chose to have Adam one-shot Yang, removing her arm. The thing about this moment is, it was a great moment. Shocking. Jaw-dropping. Unbelievable. But in doing this, it set a precedent for Adam. His power level has now been cemented. He is in a league that Team Ruby couldn't hope to face with their current training level. And this is where it all went wrong. The show went for a high-risk, high-reward plot. They cut off Yang's arm, and it gets the reaction that it actually got from the audience. Yang now has PTSD, giving room for her character to have tremendous amounts of depth and room to grow while Blake has to deal with living through a nightmare. Once again, the show now paints Adam as this end boss that is making early appearances, letting everyone know what he is capable of. He shows up, absolutely destroys with no effort, and then leaves. He set a marker for our characters to try and reach. He is here, we are here. We need to get there. However, the show never wanted to play by the rules they just set up. And from this point on, Adam isn't the same person either. Volume 4, we're introduced to a new character named Ilya. What are some traits that I could use to describe her? Faunus, same as Adam. Part of the White Fang, Adam as well. Misguided, that's Adam. One-sided romantic feelings for Blake, Adam. I, I, I just described Adam, why do you exist? Hey, at least you have a tragic backstory. I mean, we don't know Adam, so at least you're standing out there. His next appearance is in Volume 5. He set up a meeting between Hazel and Sienna as he believes it is an act of loyalty, saying, We know what you're capable of. You kinda killed a few of our people, this is the show, we're not against you. Now, the gesture itself is good. There's this acknowledgement that we don't want to be against you because we'd likely lose more people than it's worth and gain nothing from it. But then to completely go against the characterization that Adam has been built around, he murders Sienna. Yes, he's been established as this type of person who kills people. However, this is the first one of his kind that he's killed and it completely goes against what he's been set up as. The first deal with Cinder was rejected because Faunus would die. It was a threat that made him agree. Now he's murdering his own kind for the faction. It went against the Faunus cause he fought for. Now he's no longer a grey character. He's just evil. And Volume 5 just keeps that going. He goes through with the attack on Haven for no clear motivation, and once again attempts to kill not only one, but an entire horde of only Faunus, which single-handedly led to everything his character has been set up to be being erased. Because this action not only strips his care of the Faunus away, but it also gets rid of the one thing that was driving him, humans. Because of what they did, Blake now becomes the target Adam has his sights on. His story could have continued as a one-man apocalypse raising hell for humans. But the writers made the worst decision possible, and they chose to have him chase Blake. The Faunus Equality story, gone. Getting revenge on humans, gone. A romantic relationship plot, check. Adam was a strong character, not only physically, 
but also because of how he was capable of rallying people. His leadership skills were equally as much of him as any of his other traits. Blake talks about being manipulated, but by her own admission, it was because Adam was capable of convincing the Faunus. Blake herself may have felt emotionally manipulated, but it's hard to manipulate hundreds of Faunus if what he said didn't hold weight. So his ability to rally people to a cause and rise up, his seemingly natural born leadership, he was more than just physically scary as an individual. But Volume 5 once again gets rid of this characterization that he's been built up to have. The trailer, Blake's descriptions in the first two volumes, Volume 3 and even into Volume 4 a bit. Adam's entire characterization and setup for who he is and what he fights for just seemingly disappeared. Or it would have if Ilya didn't exist. If you didn't catch on earlier, the reason I kept comparing Ilya to Adam is because she is Adam. After Volume 3, everything about Adam didn't seem right. Yet Ilya picks up right where he left off. She's the misguided one now. She's the one who fights for the Faunus. She legitimately stole Adam's character. There was never any need for her character to exist. By the looks of it, Adam was set up for redemption, or at the very least righted of his misguided wrongs. But Ilya comes into play, taking his character and becoming redeemed herself. Even simple concepts that could have been made to reinforce Adam and his actions weren't taken. Part of Adam's power came from the fact that Faunus liked the results he was getting. Perhaps they may have not liked his methods of doing so, but the fact that they were being treated differently was good enough. Yet not a single Faunus spoke out in support of Adam. Instead, they are all treated as cowards who are too afraid to stand up. They are all given the moral high ground, once again painting everything that is being done into a black and white scenario instead of introducing those shades of grey. Instead of having some characters refuse to try and stop Adam at Haven, not advocating for what he is doing, but willing to turn a blind eye if it means they would no longer be discriminated, showing that it's more than just right or wrong, good and evil, but instead it's almost as if the White Fang never meant anything from the beginning. Next is his character short, and it's pretty split as to how much of this represents Adam in which way. In my opinion, there are three scenes that are really good. The opening scene shows Adam donning the first ever White Fang mask, leading a heist on some Shni dust. It's very similar to his very first representation in the Black trailer. While there's no action, it still shows how even in the early stages of his life, he acts as a leader and is doing something for a reason. It was a very classic characterization that we once had of him, and same goes for the next scene. Here, the peaceful White Fang is blocked and attacked by humans. They haven't done anything, but yet they're still being shot at for no reason. Adam steps in and kicks all of their asses, but in the process, ends up killing one of them. Gira shuns him for killing, but Sienna praises him. Honestly, this moment in particular is more about Gira and Sienna, but in terms of Adam, this is once again that moral ambiguity coming into play. He killed a man and seemed remorseful for having done it, but is he in the wrong for doing so? The White Fang did nothing wrong, and yet these people come at them with guns and blades. They intend to kill them. So by Adam killing someone to protect a group of innocent Faunus, is he really the bad guy? That grey line with his character is once again shown. The other scene that I liked was the other dust robbery. There's not much substance here, but I liked it. The scene with him and Blake on the roof is equally as good as it is bad. What this did right was once again show those early characterizations of Adam coming out. The way he and Blake talk in the clashing of perspectives. Adam believing that what he's doing is right, while Blake believing there is an alternative solution. However, there's this weird underlying connection between these two that just doesn't feel right. As talked about, Blake never described their relationship as romantic, but she acts in a way that is romantic. It's trying to pretend like they were a thing, but also trying to avoid actually confirming anything. And the throne scene was just terrible. I mean, there's no other word. The show tries really hard to show that Adam has changed. He's becoming more selfish. And there's a lot of the audience who believes that this is a good thing. That clearly you can see that he's changing, and that's so good for his character. But just because a character changes, doesn't mean that it's for the better. It doesn't mean that he has more depth. It just means that a once interesting character who was a morally ambiguous grey character became boring. You can undevelop a character, and that's exactly what happened. It tries to show this progressional change, but all you can see is that he became wasted. One that the audience no longer cared about. Then comes Volume 6, 
The barometer for who he is and what he fights for has changed. The setup was always around 75% focus for the Faunus, 25 on Blake. But that percentage kept changing and changing until his care for the Faunus was reduced to zero and 100% on Blake. It's important to note that his focus regarding Blake didn't come out of nowhere. Every time Adam was on screen, a percentage of his attention would be on her. But it's about how much. There was always this divide between Faunus and her. But after Volume 3, everything began shifting in favor of Blake. I don't know how many times I have to say this, but Adam just isn't the same person after Volume 3. So he manages to stalk Blake all the way to Argus where he somehow learns of her plan and intercepts her. A fight breaks out and Yang once again shows up. And this is the moment that wraps all the way back to Volume 3. Like I said, Volume 3 set the standard for Adam. His power level was unmatched, but here Yang and Blake go toe to toe with him despite any form of actual training. Blake legitimately, after the fall of Beacon, went on a boat, got home, went to Haven, and now she's here. There was no training of any kind on her end. Her skills didn't have time to develop because she was too concerned with gathering signatures. And Yang, despite some minimal sparring sessions with her father, it isn't enough to bring her to Volume 3's level. The thing about parts of this fight is that this is what Shane was referring to back in Volume 3. This was the sequence that was supposed to happen back then. It's why they're on equal footing. Because at the time, there wasn't meant to be such a power difference between them. Yang and Blake aren't on the same level they set up, but they still wanted to do the fight without having worked their way up to it. Adam's the final boss who's been set on very easy so you can win. And of course, his mask. Well, there goes the unique tragic backstory, Ilya. This reveal was so bad. Don't get me wrong, the brand is cool as hell. It explains Adam's past actions and why he's always been so dedicated to his cause, which makes it even more insulting that that's no longer who he is. This man isn't dedicated to helping the Faunus. He's killed so many of them that it's irrelevant. A thing like this evokes sympathy for a character, almost as if there was meant to be some sort of moral ambiguity regarding humans and the Faunus. Seeing humans, seeing the Schnee Dust Company branding living, breathing Faunus, treating them as nothing more than property that is owned. It's almost as if this brand was to shift the moral tone of the series, trying to grab a larger portion of the audience to now side with the White Fang's violent methods as being needed. So no other Faunus would suffer a similar fate. This sounds familiar. It's the same moral ambiguity that was set up in Volume 2. The time in which Adam was a morally gray character, and you could argue in his favor. But this is so insulting because it's irrelevant to what they made him. The reveal is ultimately useless. Instead, they have him screaming, why would she choose you? He was changed into a raging ex-boyfriend, and everyone hated it. And part of this is why I hate Yang's character. Not only does she not know Adam, only knowing stories that Blake tells her, but the writers had the balls to put in a line saying, Adam was pretending to be who he was when he was in the White Fang. Just because Blake didn't take her discrimination as hard as Adam, doesn't mean Adam was evil from the start. This line pretends that he never cared, that right from the get-go, he was always evil, ready to slaughter every single person who stands in his way, which just isn't true. That moral ambiguity that he was built up in having is completely washed away just so it can feel like Yang is sticking it to him. But the fact of the matter is that Yang knows absolutely nothing about Adam. She's never had a single conversation with Adam, and the fact that he even knows her name is even more shocking. Once again, go back to Volume 2. Blake literally describes her and Adam's relationship as a student-mentor deal. She never saw it as romantic, yet the scene plays out with that being the motivation. Everyone says he was abusive. Yes, his first major on-screen role, he was hitting and stabbing Blake. But you have to remember, prior to this moment, Blake only talked about him, and she didn't talk about him in the romantic way. So it wasn't an abusive ex-boyfriend being established, it was her teacher believing in a misguided cause. And of course, they kill him off. The small window of sympathy it tried to grab completely fell on its face because the things that made him redeemable were stripped away the previous two years. There's no kind of backstory. We don't get to witness how he got his brand, where he got it, why it is where it is. Revealing it opened up a lot of doors to give us some backstory and open our eyes to the hardships of what it's like to be a Faunus. Not through the eyes of a girl who goes to a school and has a hard time accepting friends, but the genuinely inhumane torture they are put through that ends up shaping people like Adam to become the person he did. But it was far too late for that. No one is born evil. Step by step you go through life making good decisions as well as bad ones. 
It's about recognizing where you're stepping when you're stepping in it. Instead of showing Adam's steps to how he got branded and the steps that followed afterwards, he's left as a final chapter without having read the rest of the book. So the show doesn't pull in an audience where Adam could be a topic of conversation. He's left hated and uncared for. I genuinely believe the writers knew they messed up Adam. There was nowhere for his story to go because they did such a poor job at keeping him consistent. Because if they thought this was a good conclusion, God save everyone. This was a conclusion and not a good one. Everything stemmed from that Volume 3 encounter. If it was just this fight, then they'd have been on equal footing the entire time. Adam's direction wouldn't have been lost or handed to another character. He suffered not only from the writer's hands, but the audience's as well. People often preferred simply wanting some cool fights over wanting a well-written character who was part of cool fights. The audience shunned who he was but liked the action he provided, and so his story never had the opportunity to play out. They never knew what to do with his character, when in reality Volume 1 and 2 did it the best. He's not in them. Adam never should have been a character who made frequent appearances. His influence in the White Fang should have been something that was seen through osmosis. How the general public reacts to Faunus, not seeing exactly what it is he is doing, but knowing that what he was doing was changing things. Keeping him as that fabled character Blake always talks about, or that endgame boss that our characters never wanted to encounter. Knowing that he was dangerous because he led what was essentially an army, but he doesn't need an army to be considered dangerous. That's the type of man everyone thought he was going to be. That's the type of man the show set him up to be. And that's why the end result is nothing but disappointing. He is the definition of wasted potential. And I'd honestly be shocked if they top it. Adam, you may have died in Volume 6, but I think we all know you died in Volume 3.